Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jillian Berry and today we have an amazing guest in store for you guys. We have Chef Ocean on and he has been raw vegan for over 22 years. You guys, he is amazing. He creates some of the most magnificent raw foods I have ever seen. And we're going to hear his story. He's long-term vegan. So I like hearing these stories, how it's going and what he's learned. And this is really just going to be a great talk. So let's get right into it. Hey, Chef, how's it going? Oh, great. How are you? I'm amazing. So thanks so much for coming on. Raw vegan for 22 years. I would love to hear what first led you to this lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. So I have, it's an interesting story and I don't think it's going to be very typical because when I first went raw vegan, there were basically no resources. It was uh, in the late nineties and I was trying to figure out how to cure my acne. So I had not bad acne, but when I was a child, I had cystic acne um, and it was I actually got into a medical book because of the severity of it. So I tried all kinds of different medications. Some people, you know, would go on Accutane, but I went more with the topical solutions, but the uh, side effects of it were pretty bad. And I didn't want to have to go through that with the rest of my life. One of them was I couldn't expose myself to sun because I was using retin-A and those retinoids, you know, I got a second degree sunburn when I was like 17. I had blisters underneath my cheeks from not understanding that, you know, how sensitive I was to the sunlight because of this topical solution that I was using to control my acne. And it did control my symptoms. You know, I, I didn't get any scarring from it, but I was also on tetracycline, which is a heavy duty antibiotic and that yellows your teeth and that, that's a permanent change. So what I found out was that diet was the biggest influence on my acne. And so I went online and researched as much as I could I think there was literally one website at the time called rawfoods.com. And then I found another website called freeacnebook.com. Uh, and I think that's actually still up. And so it, uh, between those two sites, I figured out that really what I needed to do was address my lymph system. Mm -hmm. And my lymph system was the main focus of why I was getting acne. And we can talk about that you know, more in depth if you'd like to dive into it. But I am doing, doing a, a podcast this Friday on Fruity Friday with uh, Ronnie Smith where I will be going into, you know, uh, very technical terms of why that happens. But for now, let's just say that switching to a fruitarian diet, alkalized my body, cleaned out my lymph system. And within about two weeks, I noticed a big difference. And this was after about a year or two of eating very strict, like vegan diet and still having acne. So wow. that fruitarian diet just transformed me. And I got to tell you the, the mental aspects of having adult acne you know, feeling mm -hmm. self-conscious. I mean, there's literally no pictures of me between the ages of 17 and 27 because mm -hmm. uh, I was just so self-conscious about it. Uh, dating, uh, just all of that was just kind of like set aside because of the fact that I had painful acne. So I, I would attribute that small change, which actually transformed me into, you know, following this lifestyle pretty much permanently. It, that, that was like a huge change in my life that allowed me to then build my self-confidence and then do more research into what exactly is raw vegan. And then that kind of blossomed into a larger lifestyle. Wow. Amazing. And I got to say you're almost 50, right? Oh uh, yeah. I'll be 50 in a couple months. Yeah. Yeah. You look incredible. So the raw <laughs> foods are clearly working for you. And I'm wondering when you, for when you transition like that to the raw foods and then you experience the benefits and everything, how exactly were you eating? Uh, that's a great question. So I, the, the diet that I always fall back on is cucumber, avocado, tomato salad. And that was what was recommended by this website to kind of reset the lymph system. Mm. And so that the cucumber, the avocado, tomato with a little bit of lemon juice, that's fruit, right? And then eating about two pounds of sweet fruit a day. It also advocated um, some other things. If you go on the website, you'll see it's freeacnebook.com, but they talks about eating raw egg yolks, but I was vegan. I didn't want to do any of that. So I supplemented with sprouts. So the main portion of my diet was really leafy greens, non-sweet fruits, including zucchini and making little zoodles or just shredding the zucchini and things like that. And then a little bit of olive oil, some lemon juice, and then mostly fruit. After about two weeks, I noticed a huge difference and just kept going with that. So I started concentrating on juicing like citrus fruits, grapefruit, lemon, orange juice. Uh, first thing in the morning, I used wheatgrass juice, put lemon in all my water and just basically embraced fruits as much as I could. And I, I mean, within about six months, I dropped 30 pounds and wow. I didn't mean to, but it just went away. So yeah, that, the lifestyle was more conducive to also living more outside. So I had my own garden. Uh, I actually grew my own sprouts. I did like a little design with lentil sprouts and 
pea sprouts and um, grew my own wheatgrass and then ate all of my lunches and dinners outside near my garden. Mm -hmm. And then would trade with other people in the community garden that I was with to get other vegetables and fruits from them. Like they would let their tomatoes overgrow and I would trade some of that or just ask for basil or, you know, lettuce. And so, and also sprouting a lot too, and sprouting them right directly in the sun, like sunflower seeds, lentils, mung beans. And that's pretty much how my diet is today. It's, it's a, it works for me. Wow. Amazing. And I'm wondering when you first transitioned, do you remember if you felt full? Cause I know a lot of people say, Oh, I have a hard time with this. Cause I'm never full. Did, did you experience that? Or do you have any tips for anyone who has a hard time on the lifestyle? Cause they feel like they always feel hungry. Yes. Yes. Because that fullness feeling can lead to a feeling of panic. And that panic is like, okay, what do I do? How, what do I, how do I supplement? And then often people will just start eating potatoes or rice and which are, they're okay. I mean, when you're in the transitioning portion of it, your body's literally getting used to a whole new set of chemicals that it's ingesting. So when you're eating rice or potatoes, those need to be cooked. And those are chemicals that we're creating with heat. And some of those are actually addictive, like dairy and wheat are, they have their opiate base. And so your body has to let go of that opiate addiction when you're doing that. So I would say when you're first starting out not feeling full, feel free to feel full, but just be careful about what you're eating. So you don't want to eat fried foods. Those can be very damaging to you, but steamed vegetables, like lots of rice, for instance. But then once you get past that phase, there's a, a feeling of, of satiation that happens. And that satiation results from eating food that is now more nutritious, right? Because cooking destroys a lot of the nutrition in the food. So when you're actually eating, for instance, a very large salad, and you'll see this echoed over and over, like Raw Food Romance is a friend of mine, Lissa uh, Maris and, and her husband, they always advocate eating lots of food, right? Getting lots of fiber and, and not having that feeling of, oh, I'm still hungry, but eating water rich and fiber rich foods. And that really helps a lot. So, but, but eventually your body will start to recognize I'm getting nutrition. And then that feeling of fullness becomes secondary to, do I feel nutrified? Like, how do I feel afterward? Do I feel energetic? Do I feel like, okay, maybe this food doesn't taste as good anymore, which is a reaction that our body has to, for instance, eating tomatoes or cucumbers. As I mentioned, there's a certain point at which it just kind of stops tasting good. Mm -hmm. And that's your body's signal to say, okay, I've had enough of this food. So that feeling of being full is also linked to, I would say, almost a numbness, right? Is that many people will use food as a numbing agent just like alcohol or, or drugs or anything like that, which means that there's other things in your life that you're needing to work through, needing to work on, you know, maybe a relationship, for instance, or your job or, or where you live or, or anything that's stressing you out, maybe your kids or something like that. So rather than using food to numb those feelings, addressing them directly is a much more direct, it's a much more effective way and then what you'll find is that feeling of fullness of being stuffed and wanting to sit on the couch, that becomes less important because you want to live life. You're enjoying every moment of your life at this point. You're not trying to push things away with that numbing feeling. And so that's what, what I mentioned about raw vegan is not a diet. It's a lifestyle. It's going through life in a very real way and understanding these are my problems, these are the issues. Let me address them. Let me not hide from them. And that can be really, really scary. And very difficult. It can take years to to kind of get get the hang of. But communication style may change. Where you live may change. The type of job that you have may change. Your outlook on life may change. You may stop associating with people that dump all their problems uh, on other people. And instead, you may develop a technique, meditation, yoga, or simply just connecting with people in a different way, rather than connecting over alcohol or connecting over food. Connect over music, or connect over exercise, or connect over just silently gazing at stars or, you know, those type of things are much more fulfilling. And then I found then the food becomes less important and it doesn't become this thing you hold on to, to try to numb yourself. Mm -hmm. Well said. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like the food though, and the lifestyle has changed you spiritually in other ways that you might not have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I was actually going to hope, hope to focus on that today because it's a philosophy of raw foods. And so I, I grew up Christian and I respect the Christian religion, but I found that what resonated with me more was um, a more of a Taoist approach, uh, for instance. So I, I let go of the idea of reading lots of books to learn of, and instead embracing nature and embracing journeys and finding, uh, let's see, finding joy in small things, 
like being outside. You know, I worked as a software engineer for many, many years, was stuck in a cubicle, didn't get summers off like I did, you know, when I was a kid. And I mm -hmm. would look out the window if I had a window. I look out the window and see, like, what is the, you know, why am I stuck inside? What's going on here? Right. So those moments when we actually get to go outside and be in the forest or, or smell a flower or play with our kids outside or, mm -hmm. or just have pure playtime, that's the philosophy that I started to embrace. And, and so that idea of moments that, you know, could be used watching TV, for instance, or, or just, you know, vegging out, I guess, is the other word for it. That became more of a Taoist philosophy to say that, hey, I've got some free time. Let me connect with something greater than myself. And that's what I really advocate when people go onto a raw vegan diet or a vegan diet or any changes, spend time with animals. And you'll find that they, you can really connect with animals a lot better if you just spend time with them or go into the forest and alone or with a partner and just be quiet and listen. And so that's what I've embraced more as a philosophy is that we are connected. At any moment, you can walk outside or take a bus or drive or ride a bike, whatever, and go connect with something that's more infinite, something that's greater than you, that's actually very real. Mm -hmm. And that the forest and, you know, once you're quiet in the forest, you'll hear that the birds start to wake up, you'll hear the rustling of the leaves in the forest. And all those really speak to us like on a animalistic level, right? That's something that we need. We, it helps us connect with nature. So I would say the philosophy that I've adopted is more of a natural philosophy, like mm -hmm. um, saying, hey, what can I do to make today better than yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can spend a little bit more time outside. Maybe I can work on a book that I've been meaning to write. And those little changes then kind of evolve into this philosophy of self-love. And then it becomes easy to be a raw vegan. And it becomes easy mm -hmm. to, to, to make better choices because then you feel a sense of, purpose, you know, going out and looking at stars. I don't know. I, I didn't do that for years. And now I, every night I go out for a four, four mile walk and I just look for, look at the stars and listen. And I go to a swing set and I swing on the swings mm -hmm. and that's become just a real, a real way to connect with myself and with something greater than myself rather than feeling boxed up in a house or boxed up in a cubicle or, or boxed yeah. up in a computer, things like that. Yeah. That's a, it's so important to get connected to nature. It's a great point. It really is. So you just, you don't feel quite like yourself, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We are, we are part of nature. Um, we, we do our best to isolate ourselves from nature. Yeah. Which is yeah. We can. I mean, we've got these houses, we've got cars, but is that a long-term strategy for us? You know, a long-term strategy I think would involve what would happen if our electrical grid went down, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Or if we, if our, this, this bubble that we built for ourselves, these cities and everything, it's very fragile. You know, the internet's very fragile or, or everything's fragile as we found, you know, whenever there's a natural disaster, like a hurricane or, or a tidal wave or something like that, you know, we find that our structure breaks down very easily, but in a raw vegan lifestyle, it's very comforting to know that, Hey, I know that plants and trees want to give me fruit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They want to take care of me. So let them take care of you. And that's mm -hmm. where that raw vegan lifestyle or the diet is really bringing raw, unfiltered love, the plant intelligence, right? The plants and the, the, the trees, they give us fruit. All they ask in return is that we take the seed and throw it somewhere for them because they can't reach that far. They don't have legs. Oh, true. Absolutely. And, and do you feel like there's any foods that affect you spiritually? Like I know for me, for some reason, like raw onion and garlic affect me in certain ways. And I know there's like some Buddhists and stuff that don't consume them. And cacao affects me in a certain way. Are there any foods you feel like affect you spiritually or any foods that you steer clear of as a raw vegan? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. And onion and garlic, they, they affect the gut biome and the gut biome is definitely connected to our feelings of well being, Right. And it said that like, for instance, I had um, a candida overgrowth. Mm -hmm. It was a number of years ago when I first went vegan, I was craving bread and honey and I would drive for like I was in British Columbia and I would drive for like an hour just to go to the store to get bread and honey. Found out later that was these little guys and living in my intestine mm -hmm. that were literally telling me, go get the car key, hop in the car and like go get some sugar and carbs because that's what we want to eat. So I think that those foods that you're mentioning, like onion and garlic, those can have a very real effect on, you know, how you think, for instance, or, or what your motivations are. Let's see. I, I mean, I've never met a vegetable I don't like, but I have found that garlic does make me really thirsty. Salt is something that I avoid, but I do eat lots of salt, but it's in the vegetables that I eat, like tomatoes and celery, for instance. So I will notice that if I eat at a raw vegan restaurant, which I do sometimes, you know, as a chef, I like to do my research and go out and have fun with friends. 
I'll wake up the next morning and I have like bags under my eyes, puffy face, bad mood. And it's all because of that, like the, the water retention and your body, and my body's out of balance. And now I'm really, really thirsty. So I have noticed that some foods, you know, like garlic and onions, they will, will make me pretty thirsty, but really just a sauna and going for a jog the next day, or, or even just drinking lots of water and eating a little less food the next day, you know, and just really inundating myself with water. Yeah. fixes it up pretty quickly, but I haven't found any foods that really, really throw me off balance if I'm, if I'm eating them raw. Yeah. Okay. And you've been raw vegan for 22 years, like I said, and I'm wondering, like, I'm sure you've learned a lot in that time period. So are there things you've learned where you feel like if you were starting over, you would do different, or maybe some things you would tell people like any mistakes you made or any lessons you've learned along the way? Oh my God. There's a, there's a whole pile of them. Yeah. So, well, there is, okay. So there's different phases, I think. And one is it's like the honeymoon phase, right? And I think this is a trap that some people get into, which is to just, you know, we want to be fruitarian, but where are you at now? You may be eating a standard American diet. You might be eating vegan, but cooked vegan. And there's lots of different vegan lifestyles, uh, junk food vegans right. who just eat processed food, like, you know, French fries and chips and things like that. It's technically vegan, but is it healthy for you? And then as you progress through those steps, it's important to make yourself uh, slow down, right? Is because your body is going to go through changes and to jump into a fruitarian lifestyle from like a cooked vegan lifestyle, even where you're eating nothing but fruits. Um, I've noticed that people will often just eat only sweet fruits and they're eating lots of melons and lots of bananas and just really going after like that really heavy sweet sugar high that will, that that'll burn you out because the non-sweet fruits is really what I concentrate my diet on. So zucchini, tomato, cucumber, peppers, corn, peas, sprouts, all legumes are fruits. So botanically they're fruits, even though they're not culinarily fruits. So uh, mung beans, lentils, garbanzo beans, all those things that are sprouted uh, in addition to the non-sweet fruits, that's really the center of my diet. And that's how I found I can stay on it for a long time because uh, eating things like seeds, um, activated sesame seeds, sunflower seeds in their sprouted or activated form, they provide a, a nice appropriate level of fat and not having to overeat on avocados. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see would be a, a mistake that you, we probably all have to go through if you're going to go into this lifestyle, which is to say, I'm going to eat 60 avocados in a week, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to, then you swing over and eat 30 bananas. And I heard of this, you know, melon Island thing that I'm going to do. Right. And, and what you end up doing is yeah. it's like driving a car down the street and you're trying to go straight, but you're going like this, right. The whole way. And you're, you're, depriving yourself of a variety of foods. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, it's much more effective that if you're starting, like, let's say in a, in a metaphorical sense, your diet's starting to go off track. Maybe you're not interested in anymore, or you're, you're not experiencing the same euphoria that you did when you first started it is to slowly change the diet and just straighten out the wheel. And what that means is eat in a variety of foods, research what nutrients your body needs, buy local, buy organic, grow your own food, and really develop that relationship with food where you can recognize, I'm feeling lethargic, for instance, okay? That might be because you're just simply not getting enough of the foods that might give you energy, right? Mm -hmm. Staying away from words like carbohydrates and proteins and fats. I think that's, it's good to think of it that way, but it's a little bit reductionist because food is, is, is a living thing, right? When you're on a raw vegan diet. So those things like, where do I get my vitamin C from? you know, it's easier to go into a store and, and look at the foods and train your body to recognize, okay, I'm low on something, but you don't need to figure it out. Your body will intuitively, if you're eating properly, know that, oh, I need some tomatoes today. Mm -hmm. right? I need some oranges today. And the ego just steps out of the way mm -hmm. and eating becomes so much more important that way. But the way to get to that stage is to eat a variety of foods, a huge variety, kale, cabbage, go experiment with all the brassicas, experiment with all the lettuces, go for gourmet lettuces, go for gourmet tomatoes, gourmet cucumbers, you know, everything you can get that's the highest quality possible, especially if you grow it yourself. Biodynamic is a great way. They don't use uh, sprays or pesticides and they, they usually, you know, replenish the soil and they have a very excellent farming techniques. That's real big here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So once you, once the body gets used to having a relationship with these living beings, as I said, like a tomato or something like that, then it's, there's no more paperwork involved. There's mm -hmm. no more like, okay, I, I, I guess I'm low on vitamin K because I read this article that said that leads to depression. I don't know. I'm just making this up, but 
our body knows how to feed itself. And I think that's yeah. the big mistake we make is we try to manipulate the diet too much. Instead, just eat durian, eat tropical fruits, take a, take a vacation to Mexico. Cheap. Mexico is really cheap. You know, mm -hmm. go down there and eat some mommy sapote. Eat, eat these variety of tropical fruits, non-sweet fruits. In the wintertime, you know, eating more like greens, you know, and sprouts and things like that. And eventually it, it's, it's done. Like you don't need to read books anymore because mm -hmm. you, your body recognizes all. So I would say that's the biggest mistake that people make is they, they don't train, they don't trust their body and so they true. trust others yeah. to tell them what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think people are, we're just like, a lot of people are so disconnected now and just yeah. looking, you know, and I think it's so confusing for people now too. They go on YouTube and they're like, Oh, a carnivore healed themselves. Like people come on my channel and they're like, I'm so confused. Like I saw carnivore healed themselves. Then they're like, I see your channel. Like everybody's just so confused. So I think you're just yeah. so right about like, go, maybe go to Mexico, eat a bunch of fruit and then start listening to your body. You know? Yes. Yeah. We and are, we are the best guru we've ever met in our lives. And we just need to uncover that it's hidden behind layers, but we just need to uncover. I mean, you know, we already know how to eat mm -hmm. just like animals do. And there's so many layers that we've put on top of that fears of not getting enough protein, for instance, I don't worry about protein. I mean, I, I eat sprouts and I know, you know, amino acids, I have a whole book about it called muscle fuel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I do calisthenics, but people ask me, you know, where do you get your protein? I'm, I have no idea. I just, mm -hmm. I exercise and I eat, you know, mm -hmm. that's it. I don't know where this is coming from. Honestly, I don't care. Yeah. I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm not protein deficient and I'm yeah. getting the amino acids and all the foods that I eat. It's because my body knows it already. Yeah. And I think it's important. Like, how do you feel? How does your body feel physically, mentally? How's your like cognitive function? Like, how do you feel 22 years in as a raw vegan? I, I mean, every day feels almost like, I mean, I, I don't, I don't feel the pains that my, my friends have at my age. Mm -hmm. and, and I really feel for them because a lot of it has to do with what I don't do. So I don't drink stimulants like coffee or tea or caffeine. I don't uh, take depressants. I don't numb myself with mood. I don't drink. I haven't drank for, uh, I think 22 is when I gave up drinking. I don't smoke. I uh, don't no marijuana, no, none of that stuff. I, I really, and I drink enough water. I get enough sleep and I get enough exercise. Everyone knows these things. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not telling anyone anything new, right? But it's the execution of it. And the execution of it is really where the, the concept of like yoga comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Yoga is that yoke between mind and body. What do you, what are you thinking? What do you know is right versus what you're doing, right? And they call that like the, the heart mind connection, right? That little gap between what you're thinking and what you're actually doing. So feeling how I feel is a direct result of my connecting what I know I should do with what I actually do. Mm -hmm. and, and I wake up every morning, I feel great. And I don't have these pains. I just went through, I had a traumatic injury. I was teaching martial arts and I had one of my students essentially tear my arm out of its socket, my right shoulder out of its socket. A complete dislocation, massive rotator cuff tear of 50% of my rotator cuff was completely separated from the bone. Wow. The prognosis was not good for that. And so that was, I think I'm on around day 100 after the surgery. And my doctor was amazed. I mean, I can do like, I mean, I can reach behind my back. I just went in the weight room yesterday. I have full use of my arm now. Wow. And that was, he was, I mean, both my physical therapist and my doctor were surprised by this, but I wasn't surprised because I, the food that I eat is directly going toward healing the tendon, right. And healing the muscle. And if I was on a cook, even a cooked vegan diet, all the food that I would have been eating would have been damaged before it gets there. So it's really just, mm. you know, the, um, the, the concept is simple, not damaging the food before you eat it gives you hundred percent of the benefits of the food. Mm -hmm. And they, neither of them had ever seen someone who gets hundred percent of the benefits from the food that they eat. And so they, you know, just amazed at how they were like, you know, we're, you're three months ahead of schedule here. You know, you're cleared for yoga. You're cleared for um, mountain biking, you know, these are things that I wasn't going to be able to do until December. And here it is September. And, and they said, you can do all those things. We're seeing you, you know, you're in the weight room and doing all that. And so that's how I feel. I feel like it's um, a direct result of the choices that I make. I'm reaping the benefits of it. And I'm thankful that every day I wake up and I feel great and I don't yeah. have these aches and pains. And I just want to emphasize this is within reach of everyone. You know, it's just understanding your body, understanding that how it, how it gets nutrified and not damaging the food. And then self-love will take you in far into your, you know, I mean, eighties, nineties, a hundred, you know, I'm hoping to live past a hundred. 
So, so true. Me too. Yeah. Self-love. I think it's huge. <laughs> and like a positive attitude. Yeah. And yeah, with the recovery thing, a lot of long-term raw vegans, I interview raw vegans, a lot of people say like, that's why they went into it. Like Chris Kendall and stuff like, cause the recovery after injuries and stuff like that is just like a massive difference compared to if they were eating like cooked food. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering over the years, over 22 years, have you eaten cooked food at all? Like here and there? And do you notice a difference in how you feel if you do eat it? Uh, early on I did. Yeah. Like the first year or so I'd had this hybrid diet that I called Indian food plus raw food. Mm -hmm. because I was going to college and I couldn't really afford to <laughs> yeah. do anything except eat at the Indian buffet. So I tried it for a little bit. Sounds mm. like a good diet, Indian food and raw food. It sounds good. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, make, I make awesome Indian raw food now. Yeah. But back then I was like, well, it's only $6. You know, let me try like one meal of Indian food. And then, you know, the dinner was a salad and, you know, kale, carrot, you know, tomato, you know, just a massive juice with a big salad. And I tried some steamed sweet potatoes for the first year. It worked Okay. But then what I found is that if I spent a couple of days not eating cooked food and then I went back to cook food, it literally tasted like ash. Like I, mm, I didn't wow. enjoy it anymore. And I think that's a direct result of my body saying, Oh, I, I like what you're doing over here. Let me discourage you from eating what's over here because that food, the Indian food would start to just go right through me. Mm -hmm. And like an hour or two, not an hour later, but maybe two or three hours later, my body eliminated it you know, not like forcefully, but it was just gone and it didn't even want to digest it. So it was a decision that my body made it and cooked food smells fantastic. I love the smell of roasted coffee or freshly baked bread. It smells fantastic, but it's the same sense as like I would go into a forest and smell a pine tree, right? Mm -hmm. Smells wonderful, but I'm not going to like start eating the pine cones or eating the pine needles or anything, you know? So my concept of food changed and cooked food doesn't smell or I mean, a lot of it doesn't smell good. I mean, I, I smelled an impossible burger a couple of years ago and it literally smelled like cat pee to me because of the ammonia wow. was, and I, wow. I couldn't stand it. And so my body made that decision for me. It's not a decision that I made with my brain. I think, you know, in the raw food world, people like Chris Kendall, Lissa, uh, and Nate Maris. And, you know, I, I follow quite a few on Instagram, uh, raw chef Yin being Mm -hmm. One of them, my girlfriend, uh, Victoria, uh, who's mm -hmm. Ravi Gansa on Instagram, mm -hmm. she and I write recipe books together. And at this point, there's almost no excuse to say I would prefer cooked food over raw food if you've got some recipes under your belt, because the flavors are like sunshine compared to the flavors of cooked food. Yeah. And making raw Indian food. I mean, it it's like, wow. Ugh. Why so would I good. ever want anything else? You know? Yeah. And how did you learn to become such an amazing chef? And maybe do you is there something that comes to mind if somebody wants to like try a cool recipe, but they're like, I can only do easy recipes. Is there something that comes to mind that's like delicious and easy? Oh my God. Yes. I'm, I'm into my burgers right now. And I've been like, so to answer your first question, how to become a raw food chef, I was working in kitchens since I was 14. I'm familiar with flavors. I've eaten almost every type of cuisine. I grew up in Ohio. So we ate kind of weird things, you know, and things that were considered gourmet, like frog's legs and alligator mm -hmm. and things like that. But um, really the flavors all come from plants, especially if you're eating carnivores, like, you know, those, those flavors that you're experiencing are all plant-based flavors. Mm -hmm. So the raw chefing is really just embracing what is the essence of that flavor. Like for instance, bread, right? Rosemary, garlic bread, right? Who can pass up rosemary, garlic, focaccia bread, right? So what are the flavors in that? Rosemary and garlic, and then adding those to a neutral base you know, like, uh, for instance, my bread recipe is coconut flour, chia seeds, and a little bit of psyllium husk to make it fluffy. So adding those flavors in then mimics and wakes up those associations that we often have from childhood, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what'd your mom make for you? Banana bread, mm -hmm. right? And who doesn't like banana bread? Well, adding bananas to that bread recipe, a little bit of cinnamon and nutmeg makes your house smell fantastic, tastes really good. You know, that that's really the secret to raw food chefing is capture the flavors that evoke those emotional responses, like in that movie Ratatouille, right? Mm -hmm. you, have you seen that movie? Yeah, I have seen that movie. So you, you know, remember how he woke him up? Like, the, yeah. you know, he just made something that, you know, his mom had made for him. Mm -hmm. Our emotional connection with food is, will never go away, right? If someone put, I don't know what my mom made, uh, for instance, oh, I know what it was. She would grow her own cucumbers and put yogurt on top of cucumbers and sour cream. Mm -hmm. with some vinegar and some red onions and in that with some corn, right? That was like our summertime treat all summer. And we could eat as much of that as we wanted to. And she was, yeah. she was great at making that. I, I eat that raw now and that's my summertime treat now. So I, 
I'm always going to have that emotional connection with those foods, but it's just the flavors are still there, but I'm just slightly modifying it. So it's non-dairy and it doesn't have as much fat in it. Yeah. It to, you know, yeah. so that's really the secret is find out what foods you connect with, Google the recipe or get a recipe book from me. All my recipe books are super cheap. So yeah, I'll link um, them below too. Yeah. There's just so many amazing recipes now and it literally like never gets boring, you know, even after years and years of it, like there's so many new recipes I make every week and I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm wondering in 22 years, have you had animal products at all? Or has it been over 22 years since you had them or have you craved them? Or if you have craved them or like, if you did ever crave them, would you consider eating them or no? That is a great question. Yes. And so I would say that being vegan was a monumental pivotal moment in my life. And I was staying with some friends who were vegetarian. I was living in Ohio and I just took a week off to go visit them in Missouri. So they were living on a farm in Missouri and they gave me a book called diet for a small planet. And I read that book. It resonated with me. I understood, you know, world hunger. Sure. That's a, that's a great thing to want to fix. Right. And yeah. um, so, but then after, you know, they, and they were making vegetarian meals, you know, old school stuff like lentil loaves and, you know, just really old, like the 1970s kind of recipes, lots of rice. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. they're eating cheese and stuff. So they asked me to go look at a, um, they said, drive to this location. You know, there weren't Google maps at the time. So they had to give me the left and right, you know, turn right at the, at the, at the old fire truck, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I ended up at a, at a chicken rendering plant and I saw these chickens hanging on hooks for their, and it was the, the, I think they call it the, like the bloodletting field or killing field or something where all the blood drains out of the chickens and then they come back wow. to get packaged. I sat there for about a half an hour and that hit home to me because what I saw is that it never stops. It never, ever stops. And I could hear them being unloaded from the trucks. And then, you know, and then they just stop making noise. And then they, they're just on this conveyor belt wow. that come back in. And I realized every time I went to the store and I bought that styrofoam and plastic packaged chicken breast, yeah, I was paying for one of those. Yeah. And that philosophy just, it, it was like my perspective just changed permanently from that that one experience of just sitting and watching kind of like behind the scenes what was going on and it's probably different for everyone i had i was in a relationship for about 10 years and her moment was seeing a cow with a little number attached to its ears like a little baby mm -hmm. cow and she always said that was the moment when she looked in this cow's eyes and she said you're not a number you know and she she her mm -hmm. her heart connected with that so i would say that to answer your question absolutely not I do not view animals in the same way because my heart connects with animals and with nature in such a way that my empathy level for watching animals suffering or knowing that animals are, I can't even watch videos. Like mm -hmm. I have to unfollow people on Instagram sometimes because they're, you know, in, in good with good intentions, they're posting videos of animals in trucks, like pigs in trucks or whatever. I can't watch any of that. I can't watch it either. I can't watch yeah. it. And I just think people, I think it's like so out of control these days. You know, you hear in the blue zones, they eat 90 to 95%, sometimes some of them hundred percent plants. And then if they do eat animal products, it's like a little bit, but you hear like, it's just, I feel like these days it's just like, I don't know, North America, like where I am at least like, there's just, it's so excessive. Like people are having it like morning, noon, night. It's like, it's just, you don't like, it's so excessive. Right. And it's just so many animals lives are being lost and it's so like unnecessarily excessive. I feel like. Yeah. And, and I would say my intention, and maybe, maybe we could share this together is that how we view, for instance, how African-Americans were treated in this country 200 years ago. Right. And now we're still living through the, the repercussions of, of how we treated other people, you know, mm -hmm. 200 years ago, right. My hope is that in a hundred years, we're going to view the same as animals. We're going to be like, there was a phase at which we tortured and killed animals without any empathy for them. And that's my hope is that our, our society will grow in a direction where that is now seen as like the most ridiculous thing we've ever done because yeah. it doesn't make any sense one, but it really requires a change of perspective. Cause I, you know, I grew up eating lots of animal products cause it was fed to me, you know, and then I was used to it um, going into stores, but yeah, at the age of 24, I became vegan and it opened up a whole, the whole idea of, you know, I don't get sick anymore. I don't have to worry about those illnesses. I mean, mm -hmm. you could talk about it from a health perspective, right? Is that red meat is often linked to yeah. um, a lot of health problems. But for me, the permanent change was that level of empathy, the, the heart opening moment of saying, I guess I would say, if you have a choice, right? 
let's say every day you have two roads that you can take to work, right? One of the road, you, you run over a squirrel or a rabbit every day, but mm-hmm. you get to work on time. And the other road, you don't, right? You get to work on the same time. Like, why would you make that choice? W- what's the point of that? And in fact, I would say that the road where you don't run over the rabbit or the squirrel ends up giving you a much better quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I would put it. So no, well said. I, animal products and, are no, I mean, way, no way. You look great. You're really with it. Your mind is very sharp and I can tell like it's really working for you. So I'm curious, do you supplement or no? Yeah. So I had some tests done a few years ago. So we have, as we age and, you know, I want to emphasize raw veganism or veganism for, and does not, is not make you superhuman. Yeah. Right? You're going to age, you're going to die. Yeah. You're going to get wrinkles. I mean, you're going to have all these things will still happen, but you're not accelerating it. Like you're going to go to the finish line, right? Like if you want to extend that time, don't run toward the finish line. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I had some tests done. I was low in vitamin D, which is understandable because our capacity to manufacture vitamin D decelerates over time, right? Mm -hmm. Past your 20. So the choice was either I, I lay out in the sun for half an hour, no clothes on fully horizontal. So the sun hits me and manufacture vitamin D that way, or I can supplement with a a lichen, which um, I'm actually going to be going to Sweden in a couple uh, weeks here to visit my partner. And she harvests vitamin D lichen from the rocks in Sweden. Wow. One of the few plants that actually manufactures vitamin D because we we manufacture. And if you get enough sun, you can get it, but it does become time consuming as you get older. And I looked at the supplements that I get, I ordered them off Amazon or something, and they're literally made from the same lichen. That's the source of it. Wow. So I, I supplement with um with vitamin D, and that was the only thing I was low in. Iodine mm-hmm. levels were fine. My liver was working great. I mean, the the doctor remarked that he would have been looking at the chart of a 20-year-old. Amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that was I had my blood work done three months ago. It was all perfect, but I supplement. And you don't take B12? Uh sometimes I eat nutritional yeast too. Yeah. But my B12, I mean, nutritional yeast is like a gray area and it's fortified with B12. But it has um, a lot of it in it. So, I mean, you do get, yeah. I know a lot of people don't like it, but you do get some nutrients from it. You know what I mean? You can't deny that. Yeah. 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 And and my supplements mainly take the form of like sea moss is a really big one. And I, I don't like the flavor of it. So I kind of hide it into a banana tahini smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> but, I just ordered some off Amazon. I've actually never tried it before. Is, is it a very powerful, yeah. I was going to throw some in a smoothie. Yeah. I mean, I would say my, I, even the way I look now, uh, the last three months I've been in recovery. So I had a sling on for six weeks. I was kind of almost bedridden for two or three weeks. I gained about six kilograms. I was, and I just got over taking it off. Right. So the, the main thing was that I started concentrating on chlorella, spirulina and sea moss. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you can see, but like, I don't know, maybe the, the light's too much, but my skin, like it doesn't have any of the blotchiness that I had before. Um, and the, like the, I had a little bit of redness and sometimes I would have some bumps down here and stuff. And actually at Woodstock, people were remarking how good my skin looked. I really think it's because of those micronutrients. I mean, sea moss has, is reputed to have like over a hundred of these micronutrients. Wow. Really? Wow. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, a raw vegan diet or any diet will, will get you to the 90th percentile, right? You've got most of your nutrients in there, but as, as Don Bennett, who's a well-known raw vegan advocate, and he was at Woodstock also. You really got to pay attention to your B12, your your vitamin D, and your iodine. Mm-hmm. And seaweed is a really good source of iodine, especially fresh seaweed that's not irradiated. But to get that last five or ten percent, where you really get that glow, right, and those nice clear eyes and that bright outlook when you first wake up in the morning, and you're like, "Yeah, what do I want to do today?" I believe that comes from the host of micronutrients that are most likely missing if you're eating just kind of a small variety of, of foods. So I've I've kind of moved toward the seaweed as a supplement rather than eating the, the pills as a supplement. And I have noticed quite a difference. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. I got to get more into sea vegetables. It's not, it seems like there's like so many nutrients in them and we really need them. I feel like. Oh yeah. 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 You know, the ocean is, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Chef ocean too. Right. Well, yeah. before you were raw, you said you were vegan, I think for two years. Right. And yeah. you still had acne and some stuff going on. So were you eating processed foods then I'm wondering, or was it just pretty like really clean cooked and you were still dealing with those problems? Yeah, it was, it was actually, oh, I wasn't eating processed food. So I wasn't even like, oh, you know, checking, oh, are Doritos vegan? You know, wasn't doing yeah, anything, yeah. <laughs> you know, but the, and when you're younger, you can totally tolerate that. I mean, it, it's, you know, 
I'll be, here's my tip for everyone as you age. 30 is going to be a big, big change. 40 is going to be a big change. And I'm waiting for the big change of 50. You're going to have to relearn how to live your lifestyle, right? You're going to have to exercise more. You might have to eat differently, right? So when you're in your twenties, there's a lot of forgiveness, but my diet at that time was really kind of almost all organic. Uh, out of a co-op, I was eating, I think there's a company called Fantastic Foods that makes like a hummus mixture with TVP in it. I was eating seitan, mm. I was eating bread, kind of like what other people would look at as, wow, that is super healthy. But the problem with those foods is that they were irritating me on a cellular level and especially the bread. I mean, everyone talks about gluten intolerance. I, I won't get into that. I, I don't really have that much of an opinion on it, but I don't eat, you know, I, I, I let go of gluten pretty soon after becoming vegan. But I believe that those anything that's difficult to digest is going to take energy away from the rest of your functions, like your, you know, your energy levels of your enthusiasm levels, how much mm -hmm. you sleep. You only have so much energy that you have to work with. We're, you know, the more you eat, the more energy you have, the more exercise, the more energy you cultivate. Mm -hmm. Of course, breathing and yoga, those all help cultivate energy. But at the end of the day, your lymph system is only given so much energy to work with. And if some of that energy is diverted toward digestion, digesting hard to process foods, and in my opinion, cooked grains are very difficult to digest, mm -hmm. right? Wheat, uh, dairy is difficult, very difficult to digest. But I was even eating like, as I said, TVP, which is a processed food um, that's tofu and soybeans. Anything cooked is also going to be damaged. So it's going to be chemically altered by heat if it's not already been irradiated and damaged by the processing of it. So your body can't use that stuff. It's if you're creating chemicals through heat and through processing your food by, you know, first thing you do is you take this perfectly great, I don't know, spinach or whatever, and you saute the spinach, mm -hmm. right? That creates a chemical reaction. It's called the Maillard reaction. It's a Browning reaction. And your body can't use any of that. None of that is nutritious. It's, we use it for flavor, right? And that's mm -hmm. considered like the art of cooking is, is getting the flavor out of the food. So your body has to separate out that out from the stuff that's actually good. On a raw vegan diet, much less energy is diverted toward kind of sorting what's damaged and what's not damaged. I mean, we eat mm -hmm. oxalic oxalates all the time. Those naturally occur in food. You can't use those, you know, your body needs to take them away. But the amount of energy used in digestion is far less because we're not intentionally damaging the food, right? By frying or cooking or sauteing or baking or chemically altering it with heat. Uh, 115 degrees, you know, as you know, is the, is the magic number, you know, around 42 degrees, 44 degrees Celsius. So that means there's more energy left over for other things, for doing repair work, for flushing out, you know, we, we toxins, for instance, uh, that's kind of a, mm -hmm. I know South Park made fun of that a long time ago. And I even seen like shows where they say, what are toxins really? But we, we bring in things that our body can't use for mm -hmm. nutrition and we breathe it in all the time. Um, we get it in our foods. So your body needs to be able to, to filter those things out. But what's left over at the end of the day is things that you can use to play with your kids. You know, that energy, things that you can use to do exercises, do meditation, I said, to, to work on that book you've always been wanting to work on, mm -hmm. or to just go play outside and just have fun or, or just, you know, anything that you want to do, you have more energy for that, right? So letting go of the processed foods, even though you can I mean, in my opinion, be healthy enough, right? Eating a cooked vegan diet. If most people think I, I'm doing enough, I'm happy with my life. You're mm -hmm. happy with your life. There's no reason to change, you know? But if you really want to get the most optimal enjoyment, the, the most energy that you can out of your day, it's to divert as little of your, of your energy as possible digestion. And, and the enzymes that are present in raw food help you digest the food. If you heat those enzymes up and kill them, well, you've got to do more work now. And that's really the essence of, of raw vegan diet is you're just doing less work to digest your food and you're getting more benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. So if that's it's something you want to so do. I think it's such a misconception that some people think like it's so hard to digest the living foods. I mean, that's what, that's why I went into this because I had such bad digestion and it totally fixed all of that. Like the foods just digest so quickly. So like in such harmony, it's just so much better. Yeah. So you found that it was digestion the reason that you went into. A yeah. It was one of the main reasons I had a lot of issues going on, like panic attacks, major depression, back acne, oh. chest acne. And, uh, but my digestive system was the main reason it was a mess and no one uh -huh. could figure out what was going on. I went to so many doctors. One doctor was finally like, maybe you have celiac. So I was like, what's that? I went home and then I removed gluten. And I felt like a new person within 24 hours. I was like, holy crap, how can something be affecting me like this? Like you don't really realize until you remove it. Right. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, I didn't even realize I had all kinds of brain fog until I removed that. And then that's when I really realized like how things affect me. And that's when the journey really started for me. Wow. And so yeah. how do you, how do you feel now? I feel great. I feel really good. 
So like, in, in terms of what you eat, like, are, are there yeah. any trigger foods for you that you have to avoid at this point? Well, I would say like onion, onion and garlic, they make me a bit more angry and a bit more aggressive. So I started <laughs> researching that, like I was talking about, and I see like a lot of people have the same effect or raw cacao seems to have like a negative effect on me because it like stimulates me so much. I had some of my birthday a couple weeks ago, but it stimulates me so much. And then like, I can't sleep. And then like, I come down like a drug. So that's not for me, but otherwise, like, I think it works because I eat a lot. Like I eat a lot of calories, like you're saying, like Nate and Lissa do. And I really believe in eating a variety too. And I want to get more into the sea vegetables and stuff like that as my, my journey evolves and everything. And I'm wondering, what do you currently eat in a day? Like, what do you, what's an example of what you'll be eating today? Oh, that's great. I'm, I actually came prepared with props at this point. Oh, so, yay. Amazing. Yeah. So I, when I, when I went through this recovery, I really focused on what, what do I need in order to go through this recovery? Turned out I was just re rewriting my entire diet, right? As before, I was just kind of like catch as you can. So here's a great example of what I would eat in for breakfast. So I have two bananas. Wow. Uh, I love this. You were so organized for this video. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. I have two bananas in here. I have a handful of Thompson raisins, biodynamic raisins that I found here. I have some activated tahini, which is soaked tahini first, and then it's ground in a tahini. I have sunflower sprouts that I made myself, just took some organic sunflower seeds, soaked them overnight, let them sit out for a couple of days and rinsed them a couple of times and then buckwheat. So I sprouted the buckwheat. It's a complete protein. And that's really what this breakfast is focusing on is how do I get amino acids and protein in order to, to make this recovery happen? I literally couldn't brush my teeth a few weeks ago. And then just focusing wow. on this diet. Now I've got all this great tendon strength and muscle. This is my breakfast. Sometimes I'll make a smoothie that's really similar to it. That'll be banana and tahini and then chlorella and spirulina mm -hmm. with some sea moss in it. I said, mm -hmm. I don't really like the taste of sea moss. So I sometimes I throw a date in there to try to cover it up, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm getting used to it. And then lunch for me will be, uh, oh, okay. I got more props. Hold on. Amazing. I love it. So lunch would be tomato. And then I have cucumber and I have avocado and lime. I love showing up on my food. Okay. Let's see. All right. Here we go. Went into the, the kitchen behind me. So this is a um, dry farm tomato. So wow. I'll cut that up with, this is an avocado. I eat avocados sparingly, like maybe one a week, but I don't really need the avocado, but today's an avocado day. Um, yeah. And then I have these uh, locally grown Persian cucumbers, little mini cucumbers. Which, that, those are great. I love those too. Yeah. So I'll cut those up. And then I'm trying a new recipe today, which has beets in it. So I do eat root vegetables. And so I have a golden beet and I have a, a red beet here. Mm -hmm. And then I'll cut that up with, uh, Anaheim pepper. You notice I have, a, it has a little bit of red on it. I tried to get the reddest one I could. And then a lime. So I'll just chop that up and make a nice salad for lunch. I got two giant ears of local corn that I got for pretty cheap. And so I'll just eat the corn right off the cob. And then dinner is usually arugula salad with uh, some more tomato. And then let's see, what else do I put in there? Local lettuces. And just as much as I can possibly get. Sometimes I make coconut mm -hmm. wraps. And then, all right, I got one more thing to show you. Okay, so this is this is where the the gourmet stuff starts to happen. So if I, if I'm still hungry after all that, which is pretty likely, today's a work. You know, I think I'll be running a few miles today. Yeah. So I made these burgers. So this is where these. Uh, I don't know how appealing wow. it looks on camera. But well, and the food on your Instagram page too. It, all your food just looks like next level. Wow, that's cool. Thanks. Wow. Yeah, I've been working on my plating techniques, but um, so this is carrot, onion, celery, shiitake mushroom, about half lentil sprouts with some soaked flax seeds and some sage and parsley and cilantro. Wow. Um, a little bit of rosemary in there. I just chop it all up and then make them into burgers, dehydrate them. But I don't dehydrate, dehydrate them. I make them just so they stick together. Yeah. So they're still really moist. And then I have a, um, a barbecue sauce. And I think this is, I think this is. That looks uh, so good sun-dried tomatoes and fresh tomatoes with a little bit of uh, jalapeno in there and some lime juice. And I, I think I actually made that for Woodstock, one of Chris's recipes. So I'll eat that on a lettuce leaf. And then I, I might eat six of those. I mean, I, I love sprouts and I can't get enough of them. And I just keep eating until I don't, until it stops tasting good. And then yeah, I'm, they're so I'm healthy. Yeah. So have you, you ever so thought of opening your own restaurant? I have, so I do pop-ups. Um, I'll okay. do festivals and pop-ups. I don't like being tied to a restaurant. I travel quite a bit. Yeah. So what I found is, which is much more beneficial than a, than a restaurant. And I love restaurants. I, you know, Olak and 
Wild Living Foods, Peace Pies Raw. Those are some of my favorites. Uh, Quesera Sera in San Francisco. I've literally almost gone to every raw vegan restaurant in, in the country. Arnold's Way, love, mm-hmm. love that. And I've gone to some in Europe too. Um, but education, right? If I make food for you, you're going to be dependent upon me, right? And you're going to want to buy my recipe books, which I encourage everyone to do. Like get my recipe books, you know, get everyone's recipe books, try them out. But eventually you're going to design your own menu, right? And this is what your body actually needs. So I don't know what your body needs today, Jillian, but I can make you something. And you might say, oh, this tastes good. And that's usually how we judge food. But really everyone should be their own chef on a raw vegan diet. You should figure out what foods you want to make get some ideas for some recipe books. And that's how I came up with my burger recipe. I love sprouted lentils and I wanted to find a fun way to eat them, but I can take those sprouted lentils. I can turn them into an Indian dish. I can use, <laughs> I can use them in almost any of my uh, Mexican recipes, mm-hmm. right? I can do sprouted lentil taco meat or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And those sprouted lentils are like so versatile. Uh, zucchini is another versatile thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's really what I advocate is rather than my opening up a restaurant and feeding people and my spending all this time making food that might not be appropriate for you. Instead, what I like to do is just give lessons to people. I make meal plans, find out what their goals are and really hand over the reins of health to you because mm-hmm. you're the only person that knows how to feed yourself and your body already knows how to do it. You just have to uncover it and why not make, t- make it taste good in the meantime? Why, you know, why be that aesthetic yogi who just eats, you know, eats a, yeah. you know, eats bland food all the time. We should have fun with our food. It should be a social event, but it doesn't mean we all need to eat the same. And we probably shouldn't. We all have different needs, you know, every day. If you ask me tomorrow what I'm going to eat, it would have been totally different yeah. than what I just told you today. So yeah, that's people that want me to open up a restaurant. Hey, I'll come visit you or come see me at any of the festivals that I go to. Yeah. Um, but but I'd really I would advocate that you take hold of your own health, get some recipes under your belt and write your own recipe book and call it the Jillian Berry recipe book. And it's going to be specifically tailored to you. And that's how you will mm-hmm. become your best self. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Well said. And I'd love to have you back on one day to do a recipe demo. I think that would be awesome. I would love to do that. My donuts, I didn't get to do my donuts this year at Woodstock. And that was one of the things that people asked about. <laughs> oh, amazing. Incredible. And I'm wondering, do you have any advice for anybody out there who might be struggling with their health and just having a hard time, like committing and just like sticking through those cravings or like seeing the light at the other side? Ah, yes. That's so in our society, we're, we're often isolated from each other, right? I mean, we literally live in apartments and the word apart is part of our vocabulary, right? And that isolation can lead to disconnection from our, each other in nature. So what I recommend is connection, social connection. We are absolutely social creatures. We thrive when we're in connection with other people, when we're in connection with nature, and connection with animals, and then when, when we're in connection with ourselves. And so if anyone's struggling with health issues, if there's anyone that you can reach out to on the internet, Instagram has, has some great communities for raw vegan or, or vegan, whatever stage you're at. Like I said, it's important not to hop, right? If you're carnivore and you want to improve your diet, look into veganism or vegetarianism first. Don't jump into fruitarianism because most likely your body won't react well to it. It, it, needs to, it needs a time of adjustment. But having that social connection and like we're doing right now, we're sharing. Mm-hmm. And we're sharing with people who aren't here right now, right? We're sharing stories and, and experiences, listening to each other is one of the most healing things that we can go through. And I would say that's just as important as what you eat is the people that you associate with. So if you're associating with people who are not ready to embrace the journey in the same way that you are, you may not need to find different ways to connect with them, right? And then that will open up new ways of connecting with people, whether it's through the internet or through festivals like Woodstock Fruit Festival, or or there's all kinds of fruit festivals, Dutch Fruit Festival. And I think there's a new one in LA that I heard about. That's really where the change solidifies is I did this alone when I first started and it was very difficult. And the only way that I got through it was that I, I moved out to California and joined a raw food community there. And it was called Rawtopia. I started working at a raw food restaurant called Giuliano's Raw. I helped him open his, his uh, first restaurant in Santa Monica on Broadway. And then when my community solidified and I was associating with people like, like D- David Avocado Wolf was part of that a community, Dr. David Jubbs, uh, Giuliano and his sister, lots of people started gravitating toward, you know, just cracking open some coconuts instead of having a beer. Mm-hmm. You know? That's the most important thing is finding that connection, even if it's through the internet, even if it's only once a year and letting your heart open up to other people and being honest and vulnerable with what you're going through will be the most transformative 
step uh, possible. And, and that will really solidify things. So that's, that's what I advocate. We, mm -hmm. we really need each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amazing. I love it. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I forgot to ask, have you had any problems with your teeth over the years? I know people are always wondering that. And uh -huh. do you think there's certain things that trigger dental problems with raw vegans? I mean, from what I've seen in my own personal experience and in interviewing people, I feel like dates cause a lot of problems for people's teeth. It's different if they're blended, but if you're eating a lot of dates, I feel like that's, uh, that happens a lot. So what are your thoughts on that? And what has been your experience with the teeth and the hair? Your hair looks great. So, um, and so do your teeth, but <laughs> Uh, one second, my, my fridge is complaining at me because I left it open. Oh, yeah. Okay, no worries. I got, I got so excited about showing you my food, I forgot to close my fridge. Okay, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's like us raw vegans. When I go to the farmer's market, I'm like, oh, my God, look at this kale. Look at these tomatoes. People are looking at me like, what is wrong with this chick? <laughs> yeah, that's so I will say that all of the damage that happened to my teeth and gums happened before I went vegan. It was because I, I got... Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, braces in the in the 80s, and they were very aggressive with the braces, and that caused some gum recession. Right, that's the problem that I've had with my teeth, and I've been living with that problem ever since I was 14 or 15. Right, if in the issue, you know, was actually fixed, I had to have gum surgery um, where they took some grass from the top of my mouth and and grafted it back in. Mm -hmm. But all that damage happened before I went vegan or raw vegan, and so whenever I go see a new dentist, like if I, you know, I, I'm I move, you know, and I, I, you know, see different hygienists. They all remark about, okay, you've got, you know, I see that you have recession here. And I tell them, well, it was a combination of teeth grinding from stress when I was a teenager mm -hmm. and aggressive braces. And every time they go in, they, they, th why aren't your teeth loose? You have, you know, that you're the supporting gum here, even though you've had repair on it, I'm, ex I'm expecting you to have loose teeth. Well, it's been 25 years now on a vegan diet. And my bone structure has kept my teeth. I mean, they're rock solid, mm -hmm. even though they've lost some of the support below. And mm -hmm. I attribute that hundred percent to the fact that I'm actually getting neutrified. Now I should have lost some of my teeth from wow. that level of aggressive orthodontia. Right. Yeah. And I should, they should not, I should not have my teeth. I have all my natural teeth mm -hmm. and they're still in place. They're still really solid. In fact, I bit down on a chopstick a couple of years ago and actually knocked one of them loose. <gasps> Wow. It, it, the chopstick like broke while I was biting down on it. And it was very painful. Um, I went to the dentist, I've pushed, I pushed it back in and just pushed it down. And he said, well, you're probably going to lose this tooth. Guess what? That tooth is now, it's not going anywhere. Wow. That's incredible. Right that's amazing. Yeah. That must've been scary. Dental stuff scares me. I had so many problems yeah. too, before being raw. So uh, you haven't had one cavity or lost any teeth then? Well, uh, no. So the, the thing about dates is I have also gone through a phase of kombucha, which I should also mention is I went kombucha <laughs> yeah. crazy for like 10 years because I thought, oh, I got to build my gut biome, right? You know, I've so, never had kombucha. I was at a party last night. They were offering me some and then I kind of looked at it in the glass for a bit. I didn't try it. I've never had it. What are your thoughts on that now? It's so it does really help my my gut biome. I mean, I, I can digest almost anything. I yeah. mean, I, I have a very, very good digestion. I think part of it is because of the acidophilus and lactobacillus and the probiotics that are present in most kombuchas, especially the commercial kombuchas. Even though there's a billion of them, I mean, if, if you're destroying 99% of your stomach acid, you're still getting a million of these little suckers in there. Mm -hmm. But I've since learned to let go of the kombucha and instead go with prebiotics. So fiber, water, and then eating certain foods. I actually had a gut biome test done a few, two of them done a few months ago, where I sent in uh, a sample and then they came back and said, oh, you should concentrate on cauliflower and mm -hmm. lentil sprouts. Cause there's about, I think there's 600 beneficial bacteria. So the kombucha did help with that, but I found that because the acidity of the kombucha and the fact that I was eating, like I was just, you know, I was on that not that sweet fruit kick for a while too. And that's how I learned my lesson there is eating dates. I think there's other well-known raw foodists have also had issues with dates, not yeah. rinsing their teeth afterward and having all that sugar. There's nothing you can do about that. No matter what your diet is, if you're feeding the bacteria in your mouth with sugar and not getting rid of it, or you're applying acid directly to your teeth, whether it's citric acid or the acids in kombucha, mm -hmm. you're going to wear down that, that enamel. And the only, the only remedy for that is make sure you keep your teeth clean. Yeah. hundred so, percent. So my dental hygiene is, is like, I brush my teeth and floss my teeth every day. I'm very religious about that. And I have nice, strong, straight teeth and mm -hmm. they, you know, I don't have any issues with alignment or anything like that with, you know, I don't have any jaw issues. And I think 
a lot of it has to do with just the fact that that's separate from your diet, right? You, yeah. That's that's the law of the land. You got to brush your teeth. You got to wash your teeth. Yeah. It and I think that's a great tip after dates to like <laughs> rinse with water really good after dates and floss. Like don't brush your teeth right after eating them. Yeah. Once you're done eating your food, just clean your teeth. And yeah. um, so Victoria, who, you know, I'll be visiting her in a couple weeks. She always carries like a little dental pick with her. And after she eats, she cleans out those things. And her teeth are absolutely gorgeous. She's She doesn't have any issues with cavities either. And she's also a hundred percent raw vegan, but, uh, but yeah, like, like I said, raw veganism is not a, it doesn't make you super human, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to have yeah. issues and those issues need to be addressed with exercise and good hygiene and good dental hygiene. So I'm glad yeah. you asked about that. Yeah. Because yeah, that, I think that that is um, maybe something I want to address also is that sometimes people go into a raw vegan diet thinking that they're going to become invincible, right? And that they don't need to do these earthly things anymore. They can go to Hawaii and live in a tree house and a shoe, you know, not, not have to use toothpaste or toothbrushes anymore. And, you know, like, and not have to do like, they become more like spiritual, like over, I would, I would say overly spiritual, but less grounded. Right. And I, I don't know if you've seen that with some people where they just, they kind of adopt a philosophy where they say, Oh, I, I don't need to do this maintenance on my body because it will take yeah. care of it. Oh, oh, I have. Yeah. 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 And that's just um, that that grounding aspect, I think, is what a difference is between myself and some people that I meet along, you know, at festivals or along my journey is that they become very, um, very, I I would say, like up here Mm -hmm. uh, and say, and they adopt a philosophy of wanting to to not ground themselves. And sometimes people make the mistake then of grounding themselves with food Well, grounding yourself literally means like what am I touching the ground today? Am I like doing something difficult that I can't do? Like weightlifting would be a good example or yoga, Mm -hmm. like learning a new yoga pose, right? If you go through your day without any obstacles, that's going to make you less, that's, uh, you will be, you'll become less resilient than if you introduce obstacles in your day. And what I mean by that is if you go on a walk and, and you're not breaking a sweat on your walk. Well, next day, go on a little bit longer of a walk, or maybe go on a, a, a try to climb a hill or something, get to the point where things are a little bit difficult. And that's a very grounding technique where, you know, try a new yoga pose, get a little farther down into your yoga pose, or if you're weightlifting, or I like rock climbing, like try something that you're not good at learning a new instrument and understand that that journey that, you know, it's a, it's a Taoism, Taoist philosophy is that the journey, not the destination is what we're here for, right? And if that journey presents challenges to you, you're going to become more resilient, more grounded, and then you will adopt more of a realistic philosophy toward life, which is to say, my attitude towards my teeth isn't going to make as much of a difference as me actually brushing them, right? Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting at is that we can have intentions, but unless those intentions are grounded in our three-dimensional reality with actual actions, those intentions will not be as effective as actually taking the time to do your exercise or actually taking the time to hug someone or tell someone that you love them, right? Mm-hmm. Verbalize that. They, they can't read your mind, you know? Okay. Make eye contact with people. You know, do something that's difficult for you. Get better at that. And that's really what I think goes beyond the diet and beyond any philosophy is we're here to grow and we're here to, to face challenges. And if you don't have any challenges in your life, then you need to find some. Yeah. And, and that's how you grow. And that's how you be a better person. And that will ground that will ground you and keep you from becoming this like overly uh, mental or overly spiritual person that ends up with tooth problems because I'm too good for brushing my teeth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering, do you have any books other, I know your food recipes are amazing and all that, but do you have any books other than that too? Cause I mean, the way you speak and just your depth and your spirituality, I think it would be great if you had books on other things too. Oh, I got a whole list of them. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm just getting started. So okay, amazing. I'm, I'm moving into retirement. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a software engineer, probably going to retire in, in 10 years or something like that. And so I, I, let me, let me go through the list of, of things that I want to, I want to, leave is my legacy. So I got, so I got 10 recipe books to go through. So wow. I got all kinds of genres. I got them all written out. Those will be coming out in the next year or two. And do you but have wanna... like a link tree or something I can link below that has like everything? So rawvegan.love, my website okay. has everything. And then my Instagram is at rawvegan.love. Yeah. And those I, you know, and you can join my newsletter, go on rawvegan.love, join my newsletter, and you'll get notified as these books come out. But to address what you're talking about, which is the educational portion of it, I need to get the recipes out of my system. 
right? Because that's the largest audience I have, right? People who just, they want to eat the food. They want to enjoy the food. And that's the end of their journey. They want to enjoy their food, right? But I, I want to talk about acne. So I'll be writing a book about that. I want to talk about recoveries from injuries. I want to talk about philosophy, like the, the, the idea of Taoism of raw foods or the philosophy of connection with nature, which I think would be more akin to like Wicca or, or animism, you know, these more ancient religions that really connect with animals and, and view animals as like, a very intelligent form of life. And then I want to tell people about how I went through this journey about my autobiography. I lived in the, I lived outside for a year after I went raw vegan. I went like, wow. moved out of my apartment, put my stuff in storage and literally lived outside without a tent. And that was one of the most eye-opening experiences. So I want to tell people about that because adopting a raw vegan diet is like this much of a larger expansion. So it's about boundaries, mm -hmm. right? We have boundaries you may find yourself living in a new country, having a new partner, having new friends, finding yourself in a brand new body, right? And these can be scary and enlightening at the same time, but these boundaries unlock the, the fact that we are limitless beings. And I, so I want to, I don't know how to talk to people about this. So I, I meditate on it and I want to, I want to address it in like a very methodical grounded way, but we are magical beings. Mm -hmm. We are absolutely unlimited in our potential and the way to unlock that potential is the greatest teacher beyond me, beyond anyone that I've ever met is to simply just be outside and just go into nature. And that's like all of our potential is just unlocked as soon as we do that. So I yeah. do want to start a YouTube channel, but how do I get people to you get should. off YouTube and, and go? You're, just, you're so like, like you really hold attention well and you're just so well-spoken and logical and like sharp Thanks. and it's great. And I'm so interested about you living outside mm -hmm. for a year. I think we should do another video sometime just about your experience doing that. Yeah, that was, a, yeah. That was an opening experience. I, I do it for about three months every year. I just live outside. Wow. I, oh, that's so awesome. What a way to connect and just like recharge and refresh and like get connected with who you really are. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Have So what's, what's the longest camping trip you've ever done? Oh, I can't even remember. Not long. Probably when I went to Woodstock 99, like the music festival, like three days. Uh -huh. I've never three days, probably max. Oh, yeah, that's that's a minimum. I would say, I mean, if you can get out there for three days, that's a huge accomplishment because that's the biggest step is getting out of the house. Yeah. Right? But I mean, here's here's a bucket list, right? See the Milky Way in all of its glory, at least once in your life. I mean, and that means going away from the cities, going away from lights. Mount Shasta is one of my favorite places to go. I've heard Big Bend mm -hmm. is a great place to go, or even British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, the night sky, most of it's hidden from us because of the light pollution. And just seeing what the actual Milky Way or the actual night sky looks like unfiltered mm -hmm. is, that's a life-changing experience. So I'd say that that would be a good start is to get at least go on a camping trip where that would be the goal is to just gaze one night and see. It's like someone took a paintbrush and just went <laughs> across the whole sky. I mean, we don't need telescopes. We can see all that with our eyes. Mm -hmm. And then and then the other thing I recommend to, pe to people is uh, connecting with uh, natural hot springs and feeling for the first time, maybe what it feels like to be in the womb of the earth, right? And having You're that- You're on fire planet. here with the way you talk. Yeah. Oh, it's it's like I, <laughs> I plan all my vacations around hot springs. And and I, I mean, I've visited you know a dozen hot springs and I, I love going to them, but it's literally the the heat of the earth, the fire of the earth, warming water, which is one of our most basic elements, and then bathing in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's if, if that doesn't change your life, I don't know what will. Wow. So if you combine the two, looking at stars while you're in a hot spring. Yeah, then it's just the ultimate. That's so awesome. Yeah. I've never been in a hot spring. I would love to. But yeah, that's so awesome. Well, I think you're incredible. And I want to thank you so much for coming on. For sure. And again, I will link everything below. And I'm sure my guests will love it. If you guys want to see another video with Chef Ocean, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to have you back, like I said, for the recipe. And then maybe Absolutely. one to talk about your one year outside, because that's pretty huge and awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make some food together. That sounds great. I'll put on my chef outfit and yeah. get on my knives. Yeah, we'll make some food. That, that sounds great. I would love to yeah. be back. On the okay. Awesome. And, with you today. Yeah, you too. And to the viewers, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, give it a big thumbs up right now. Make sure you subscribe if you don't already. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Excellent. Bye.